As the turbulent and violent days of the Middle Ages came to an end in England, the design of buildings began to change dramatically. Defence was no longer the main priority. Instead, fortified houses and castles gave way to grand country houses, which were much more comfortable places to live in. But the wealthy folk of Tudor England wouldn't have been able to take possession of such magnificent new homes if it hadn't been for the skills and efforts of one particular type of craftsman. This was the age of the carpenter. Changes that turned an Englishman's castle into his home didn't happen overnight. It was a very gradual process that began back in the Middle Ages. In Stokesy Castle in Shropshire, we see the first stages of these changes. It's England's oldest moated and fortified manor house, and it has hardly altered since the time it was built in the late 13th century. It was built by a wealthy wool merchant called Lawrence of Ludlow, and what he desired were a comfortable mansion or house for his wife and, and children and himself. The thing is that it also had to have a degree of fortification. The house he built took advantage of the newly established peace on the Welsh border. Its fortifications were a bit of a status symbol, and they wouldn't have been able to resist a real attack. What they did was to provide the sort of security a wealthy family like the Ludlows would have needed against burglars or unruly mobs. Their money had come from the wool trade and Lawrence of Ludlow built up the business to become the wealthiest wool merchant in England. It was a very profitable business to be in and merchants like this were the new rich of the day. This was reflected in the sort of house he was able to have built. Until this time, merchants had lived in houses in town. Only the landed gentry could have afforded something on this scale. In the centre here, this, this is the house proper, which of course is built out of local stone with like mud stone inserts, which you can see have rather suffered a bit where it's all crumbling. And over there, behind the flower beds, is the curtain wall, which, of course, years ago would have been a great deal higher, giving, in this courtyard here, a, a greater sense of security and enclosure. Um, the North Tower is the oldest part of all the lot of the place. Of course, you can see in these rooms, they were really built more for defence than comfort. I mean, with the long, thin windows or arrow loops, not found anywhere else in the wall manor. You know, the other parts have got nice big windows and it don't really do anything now other than serve as a home for the swallows. It's all very different when you get up here on the, on the second floor. Uh, all the walls are timber framed and filled in with lath and plaster. It must have been a very important room, you know, for the family. And, and of course, if you had any friends around, there's wonderful views of all the countryside out through these lovely windows. But I rather think that when this bit was stuck on top of here, you know, there were more peaceful times. These walls on the top floor actually project out over the stone walls below. It's a building technique known as jettying, and it was developed during the 14th and 15th centuries. Yeah, this little drawing I've done is to try and explain the principles of jetting out, you know, like hanging over or making the bedroom a bit bigger. This vertical timber here and, and this one and, and that one, uh, the actual outside walls of the, the lower chamber, when they put the floor joists on, there could be as much as two to three feet of an overhang, which, of course, in, in the case of both sides of a room, made the room six foot bigger, you know, which were quite a, a saving in a way. And then, to compensate for this overhang, they, they made these rather nice little brackets, which, of course, help support the floor above. Jettying will become very common in timber frame buildings of the later Middle Ages. 
But this North Tower at Stokes is a very early example of the technique where they actually built the jetted wooden structure on top of the existing stone tower. Yeah. All right. Up here you can see what this jetting out business is all about. The, the actual horizontal ones like, like this one and that one there are the actual floor joists which are supported by these props and these bracing pieces Bracing pieces are mortise and tenon and pinned across with wooden pins. And these here props here are resting on these stone corbels, which give it support. But they also, the, the support for these here pieces at 45 degrees, there are all sorts of handles actually. In a way, it's a very clever way of pinching another room above that's maybe as much as eight or nine feet bigger than the room below in the, where the stone walls are. The timbers they used for this had to be pretty substantial. And I followed their example when I built this. Yeah, I've always been interested in carpentry on a large scale. I once had a friend who, who started life off as a joiner and ended up as a fiddle player in the Alley Orchestra. And he was a bit like me, he was a frustrated steeplejack and also had a great interest in coal mining. And we, we promised ourselves in the pub when we'd had a point or two that one day we would build a wooden pit headgear. They're quite ornate to me, I, I quite like it. In the olden days, they had a bit of style about it, all these fancy ends on the woodwork. Poor Kenneth, alas, he didn't live long enough to see it finished, but I just kept making a bit here and there, and then eventually I, I bolted all the bits together very much the same way that they would have done it back in the Middle Ages. Really, it's not everybody in a residential area who's got a pit headgear in the back garden. <laughs> but to me, it's rather an handsome piece of carpentry. Stokes is full of timber work on a grand scale like this, especially in the Great Hall. As you can imagine by its size, this room was the, the most important in the wall of the manor house. The feeling of greater space, which is brought on by the great massive roof and the, the roof trusses, which at the time of the erection would have been leading edge timber technology. Everybody was striving to span the greatest distances with arches made of wood. The crook beam was the answer, and Stokesy has a very early example of a crook roof. This little drawing I've done here, it shows like the basic principles of the crook beam roof construction. And basically it's two bent trees, <laughs> and they must have had a man going round all day looking for bent trees. <laughs> There's a bent tree, and, and that is roughly the shape of one of these great beams. They, they just lean one on the other, and then very few basic joints, nearly all our flap joints, and of course, you know, plenty of oak pegs to hold it all together. And then, of course, this collar or beam across the horizontal beam across the top would give it even more stability and, you know, stop it like collapsing inwardly. And then the, that, that would brace by small, rather small internal bracing pieces and various bits shoved in anywhere, really, that would, that would give it a bit of support. We can see how a roof like this is made because all the woodwork in this 14th century barn at Pilton near Glastonbury was destroyed by fire and a new crook beam roof very similar to the one at Stokes is being made for it. It's all being done at a workshop in Berkshire where they specialise in historically accurate timber frame constructions. I came here to find out how you go about constructing a crook beam roof from the owner, Peter McCarty. Back in, in these times, would, would it all have been done on floor like this? Yeah, they certainly would have done it mm. on a floor or, yeah. or in a framing Level. yard. Yeah, yeah. There are, there are mm. documentary references mm. to, to the mm. term framing yard. Mm -hmm. I think the important thing is that, that it would have been done, mm. uh, as we're doing it, as a sort of prefabricated uh, manufacturing operation. But it's quite an operation just getting timbers as big as this and as heavy as this together. Although we've got the forklift to help us, mm. uh, I mean, most of it is done with, we use a big commander, mm. you know, a big wooden, mm. wi big wooden yeah. mallet, just as they would have done back mm. in, uh, well, mm. 1280. 
The holes, you can see, are for the pegs that hold the joints together. Each one has got to be cut from a log like this and then shaped by hand. For a roof of this size, they have to make around a thousand of them. Would you like to have a go? Yeah, yeah? I'll, 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 now that I know you want a octagonal shape and not round, right. I'll be all right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Mm. Hey. Mm -hmm. This little bit in there, it's, it's not... that little uh, metal bit here, you know, yeah, it's, it's getting a bit, bit goosed, yeah. isn't it? The timber has to be really green for a lot of these hand tool operations. The softer the wood, the easier the job. Then they let them dry out and harden for about three or four weeks. Mm. Yeah. So you see, these are the these are the main collars, and these yeah. are the the upper upper cruck, mm -hmm. uh, second tier of uh, um, crux. And then we've got in in between them, we've got these intermediate uh, yeah. pr principles, and we're now marking and jointing in the purlins here. I mean, when you think just to lift something as big as this from the horizontal to the vertical. Yeah, must have yeah. been a rare uh, feat and must have had a lot of men and uh, yeah. a lot of rope and a yeah, lot of swearing, yeah. no doubt. <laughs> the technique of crook beam construction was used throughout the later Middle Ages and can be seen in houses large and small, like this cottage in the village of Laycock. And jettying wasn't just for the rich folk either. Here at Laycock, the villagers lived by weaving when the wide looms were introduced in the 15th century, many of them had houses built with jetted out first floor rooms to accommodate the new machines. It was the age of the carpenter, a time when the craft of working in wood reached its peak. Master carpenters began to develop specialised jointing techniques and make big advances in the mechanics of how a timber building was put together. By the time of the Tudors, they had found ways of spanning wide spaces with massive timber roof trusses. Timber was the main construction material. And the carpenters who built these places were the great engineers of the day. Little Morton Hall in Cheshire is one of the finest examples of timber-framed architecture in England. It's typical of the early Tudor age, and again, a moat wasn't really designed to keep out the enemy, more to impress the neighbours. It was built over a period of 120 years in the 15th and 16th centuries by three generations of the Morton family who had been powerful local landlords since the 13th century. The main building materials about this time were still timber, especially in north of England. They basically set off with a, with a plinth of stone or brick and then made these frames that, that weren't very big, they only did like one story at once, and stuck them up on the edge of the stonework and then interlaced them with all sorts of bracing pieces, as you can see. Considering the amount of acreage of land that the, the Morton's owned, they mustn't have been short of a few oak trees when they started building this place. The timber would arrive here still in the round and would be split with iron wedges and then cleaned up with an adze. Then the mortises and the tenons worked on the ends of each piece. And, and then, of course, the beginnings of the erection with the, the pegs and the, the holes through. I've made this small model to try and portray how they went about building half-timbered houses in Tudor times. One of the first pieces would be a corner post, which would be stuck in the mortise hole, possibly hold itself up with a couple of pegs in. So we've got the corner post up, you know, like so. And then the, the cross members, like that's all been marked so we know exactly where it fits. When you look at half timber buildings, the vertical ones are never very long, maybe 10 or 12 feet. Two or three decent lads, you know, of reasonable fitness and strength could get, get one like this and manhandle it up and more or less shove it together like I've done. Uh, and, of course, then more pegs in the holes to 
sort of hold it all together. And then finally, the top rail, which would be dragged up, no doubt, on ropes, uh, tied to a couple of pieces of fur pole sticking up. And then when they got it, you know, up in the sky like this, you'd get that tenon in. And then this, this tenon in, in next one. And, of course, more pegs then in the, in the holes. To fill in the spaces in between the framing, the first ideas they come up with were like lath and plaster, which is really just chopped sticks that were nailed in into a sort of rebate. And then they plastered it with a mixture of cow dung, sand and lime. And, of course, it, they referred to it as wattle and daub. They did it both sides, so it's held an air cavity in between, which, of yeah, course, would be good insulation. But you do see examples of a, of a great crack all the way around the edge where everything shrunk, and I suppose the draft holes in in the winter. The big weakness of our timber buildings is the ends of the vertical framing, because where they touch the stonework, you know, there were no fancy damp courses or anything like that. The, the, the rock set in at the bottom... Some must have gone rotten quicker than others. That's why the thing goes, you know, downhill and all the horizontals end up little de piddly, like this lot behind me. It almost looks as though it could all come tumbling down at any time. Here's rather a grand example that shows why, like, the buildings all settle down. This vertical post once stood on the top of this kneeling stone and now, of course, it's gone a bit air wire and it's obviously suffering from pressure that's coming from above. Over the years, as the building developed, it became sort of an hodgepodge of buildings all around this central courtyard. The oldest parts are the, are the uh, Great Hall and the East Wing over here, which have changed very little uh, since the modernisation scheme in the 16th century when these rather wonderful bay windows were added. The man who did the job, Richard Dale, left his mark behind here, here on this window frame. It says, Richard Dale, carpenter, made this window by the grace of God. It's like an early bit of advertising for window frame making. One of the secrets of the carpenter's trade was the variety of joints he would use in a building like this to hold it together. Really, the mortise and tenon joints in one form or another is the main joint in, a, in an half-timber building, you see. All, all these cross members have a tenon on each end. This is the tenon, and that's the mortise hole. And it, when you knock the wedges in there, it opens up the tenon to get a really good grip which would be sort of used on the, on the corners, uh, as you might say. The, uh, the other joint is like an open-ended mortise and tenon joint, which you can do a lot of interesting things with. You know, you can make octagonal-shaped structures, or, and, it, and it goes together in any way. You know, you're no trouble struggling getting it together. It also would handy for extending the length of a, of a beam, but it couldn't, wouldn't be any good under compression. You know, it'd just snap. And then, like, the simplest one of all, really, is, is just an half-lap joint. It could be used like the, the other mortise and tenor joint on corners, like corners like up here, you know, sort of style. And they were all clever lads with these fancy joints. One of the things that makes Little Morton stand out is the fact that there's all this lovely stuff in between the, the framing, which, of course, is all made of wood. The beautiful... Four-leaf clovers are called quatrefoils, and of course they're sawn out of one solid lump of wood to that shape. In the olden days, the more fancy work you had on your half timbered house, the richer you were. So the Mortons must have been quite well to do. We don't have any record of how much time Richard Dale spent on this work or how many men he had working for him but it must have taken a heck of a lot of man hours to do woodwork as elaborate as this. What we do know is that he became a good friend of William Morton and they spent a lot of time working together on their plans for the house. It wasn't until the 1570s when the Mortons had already been at it round the back for a hundred years that they decided 
to build this new and splendid frontage. At about that time, long galleries became all the rage. Any house that were worth anything, it would go to have a long gallery. You've got to show the neighbours the one-upmanship thing. And the long gallery is basically a long, thin room built right on top of the house, purposely put there to engage your, your, your neighbours in entertainment and, and exercisable, like a bit of a, an old studio thing on top of your own house. It would never have had a, a lot of furniture. It was used for recreation. When it was raining out outside, the Elizabethan ladies would walk from one end to the other all afternoon, no doubt chatting. So the Morton family decided they'd have to have one. The trouble was, they had the idea after the building work on the South Range had begun. What they did was to stick this long gallery on top of the roof without putting any proper support in for it. And the result was a bit of a disaster. There's nothing really wrong with a, a timber frame construction, you know, it's very strong and I'd rather think almost earthquake proof if it's, you know, done all right, but and not be messed about with in any way, you know, people cutting holes in where they shouldn't do. The thing is, this were like never right from the beginning. There's obviously evidence that what's underneath the floor is uh, not very hot, is it? You know, it's all gone diddly piddly that way. Through the excessive weight on the roof of these stone flag slates, the windows and the framing have started to go outwards, and way back in distant past, there's been an attempt to stop this by fixing up some, well, there would be about eight, be five box of oak, which are anchored to the wall plates in an attempt to stop it going out. And then at a later date still, there's iron tie rods been inserted to help again. Just recently, the National Trust have done some pretty important engineering to make sure the long gallery doesn't go any more out of shape. And here is Jeremy Milne who's one of the team who were partially responsible for the, the construction and the installation of this great iron frame, and he's going to tell us all about it. Isn't that right, Jeremy? <laughs> Perfectly true. Mm. Well, the Trust about uh, ten years ago was faced with a rather alarming report from our structural mm. engineers, and uh, we were not allowed to take more than ten people up into the long gallery at, mm. at once, yeah, or, once. Oh, or, yeah. or, or the thing might have collapsed yeah, into the yeah. moat. Mm. And the prescription that he came up with was to introduce uh, a steel uh, lattice system in underneath these uh, pentis roofs, this triangular-shaped element of roof mm. underneath the windows of the long gallery, mm -hmm. which you can't see. And they support the posts of the long gallery itself, which have this tendency to buckle under the considerable weight mm. of the roof. I don't think anybody's ever tried to measure the weight of the roof, but it's always been said that the, the grit stone slabs on it mm. equate to about ten double de decker buses. That's true. Uh, yeah. People don't realise until they've actually picked one up, do they? How heavy them flag slates are, really, yes. very heavy. And the amazing thing is, the whole weight of all the structure, the roof and all the timber framing and all the floors is all resting on the masonry at the bottom. And, and the many repairs that have been done over the centuries for, to the timber work at the bottom, not one iron dowel has been found, you know. It's, it's just rest in there, like a doll's house, you know, bang. What I like about it is the way that all that lovely timber work is all on shore. But why don't we have more half timber buildings like this? Well, they might be good to look at, but you talk to anybody who's tried to live in one through a British winter, and they'll tell you that they're pretty cold and drafty. By the end of Queen Elizabeth's reign, around 1600, more new houses were being built of brick. It was warmer, drier, altogether more comfortable to live in. So if you've got any money and you lived in a medieval timber-framed house, you'd either build a new house or modernise your existing one by encasing the earlier timber frame in brick. Harvington Hall, near Kidderminster, is a good example of this. When you step inside, it doesn't look a lot different than Little Morton Hall. You know, it's a great timber frame. But there's one difference, for a start, the fact that instead of having wattle and daub in between the framing, they're actually bricks. When you stand outside, you'd think the whole thing were a brick building, but it isn't. It's only a non-mold burning skin that's on the outside. 
the weight of the building still taken with the great frames and all these wonderful dovetail iron plates stop it all spreading out. So whether it was built with brick like Arvington or lath and plaster infill like Little Morton, the timber frame was still the main method of construction. The Elizabethan rebuilding of Arvington that gives it its present appearance was carried out in the 1580s by Humphrey Polkington. Polkington was a leading Catholic at a time when practising the Catholic faith was against the law. In the late 1500s and early 1600s it was high treason for a Catholic priest to be in England. Keeping one under cover was punishable by death by public torture. These hideaways have got to be very cunningly hidden amongst the joinery and the staircase in this instance. You've got to be able to get in these things pretty fast and get yourself comfortable in this wonderful hideaway. I'll have a do at getting in a bit quick. <laughs> and once you'd gone in here and the, the authorities were only still halfway down the drive, this, this is like a double hideaway. There, there were actually another frame here with bricks in, and the hinges and the, the catch here are still in, in place. The room behind me is uh, quite large, really. It's about six feet, a six foot cube, actually. I should imagine an hour or two wouldn't have been so bad, but when the powers that be were playing real hide and seek with a serious ending if they got you, uh, you know, maybe a week of searching round your house, it, 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 you know, get a bit claustrophobic after that, I rather think. Harvington Hall contains the finest series of priest halls to be found anywhere in the country, and four of them are situated round this very staircase and show the trademarks of one Nicholas Owen. Nicholas Owen trained as a carpenter and a mason, and he was without a doubt one of the best builders of hiding places in all of history. His trademark was the different layers you had to get through to find the hide. Where's the hide in here? This raised platform used to be a boot cupboard with panelling up walls, but take a look at this. <laughs> I don't think they had as much Guinness as I had in them days. <laughs> this, this is actually a triple hideaway. Of course, before you could come through that slot that I've just come through, you've got to move the, the doors off the cupboard, shift a few books, then shift the, the oak panel in, and then eventually you come to this beam, swing that open, and then you were in, you know. Very claustrophobic in here. I rather think that mead weren't quite as fattening as Guinness. Owen was eventually captured and he died under torture in the tower. But no priest was ever found hiding here. And that's why the priest holes have remained intact. Yet another tribute to the skills of the carpenter. Next week I'll be going north of the border to have a look at the work of some Scottish builders and to look at one of the most important works of a Scotsman who created a style of building that was so distinctive it was named after him. If you'd like to find out more about the building of Britain then why not visit the website at bbc.co.uk slash history.